you found Why We Are Christians. My name is Kent Philpott, and my guest is somebody I've been trying to get on this program for a long time. He's from Spokane, Washington. His name is Greg Beamer. Welcome, Greg. Good to see you, Kent. So you just got here yesterday, I think. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> and your brother drove you down. From Martinez. From Mar you took a train from Spokane to Martinez. Yes. Wow. Was that a good trip? It was one of the most relaxing trips I've ever taken. Really? I, I got a, a sleeper car for the first time. Wow. So I got to stretch my whole body out. <laughs> You're a big guy. <laughs> well, well, Greg, um, where, where, did, where were you born? Kodiak, Alaska, 1949. Really? Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about your parents your family. I was raised in the Navy. My dad was a career officer, so... Every two or three years, I moved two or 3,000 miles, which being in the Navy, that's how far it is from one ocean to the next. <laughs> yeah. East Coast, the West Coast, the Philippines, uh -huh. and back to California. Okay. So. Uh, brothers and sisters? Two brothers. Two brothers, both, older or younger? Both younger. Both younger. Both younger. Okay, but same as me. I was the oldest of three, three yeah. boys. Okay, there you go. Yeah. You know. Um, uh, where'd you go to high school? I went a little bit of high school in uh, Seattle at Roosevelt. Okay. And then I did the, the rest of it in um, Walnut Creek, California at a place called Del Valle. It's not there anymore. Walnut Creek. Is that where you met David Hoyt? No. I met him in San Francisco. Okay. <clears throat> All right. You met him in San Francisco. We'll, let, we'll get to that okay. a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, so, Greg, did um, <clears throat> you play any sports in school? I enjoyed baseball. 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 I'm a baseball guy too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm A's and a Giant fan. That's it. So, so what baseball team do you root for? <clears throat> Oakland and San Francisco. Oakland and San Francisco. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll imagine that. I'm an A's Giants fan That's all it. the way. Yeah. Yeah. Live or die, you know. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> you bet. So uh, did you have any church background? Not really. They, they, <clears throat> they had church services in the military, and I, I didn't go on a regular basis. They pretty much had a, a chaplain for the Protestant service, a chaplain or a priest for the Catholic service, and a rabbi that would do a Jewish service. And that's, that's it. So that's what you were, that you were exposed to early on. Right. Did it make any kind of impression on you at all? No, not that I remember. Your uh, high school days were spent there up in the northern part of the uh, Northwest. And what did, what did you do after you graduated? <laughs> I moved into San Francisco to be a hippie. <laughs> wow, that's an, a career goal. I, I, I'll play music and be a hippie, yeah. Okay. Or take drugs and, and be that lifestyle. Okay. So uh, you were attracted to the San Francisco uh, <clears throat> Seen in the Haight-Ashbury? I was already in it before I got out of high school. Really? You remember where David had that Upper Streams house in Walnut Creek? Yes. I went to high school a little farther down the road than that. Okay. And that's the area I grew up with. And it was, I had great access to Berkeley. Okay. And San Francisco. Yes. So, so, so as a kid, you, high school kid, you're traveling <clears throat> to the beat scene where that's all going on. That too, yeah. Okay. And so somehow you came in contact with David Hoyt. No, I came in contact with you. That's how I met David Hoyt. Oh, okay. How did you meet me? I met you. I got, <clears throat> in March, one of the guys, that was. we started a Bible study, and one of the guys said, well, hey, they're going to do this baptism in the ocean in March in San Francisco. Do you want to go? And I said, yeah, it says I got to go if I'm going to be obedient to God. I got to get baptized. You okay. Know? I didn't understand it, but... He explained it to me, and so we went over, and we came to the Soul Inn is where we came. The Soul Inn. The Soul Inn. This, okay. And, and they, that's where the group was getting together to go down to get baptized in the ocean. I think, is it called the Cliff House? By the Cliff House. By the Cliff House. Just, yeah, a little bit left of the Cliff House, a little bit south of the Cliff House. Yeah. Yeah. That's the spot. Yeah. That's exactly right the Right at the end of the Richmond District. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we, the Soul Inn was on Balboa between 41st and 42nd Avenue at just 
about six, seven blocks up from the ocean. Yeah. And that's where we baptized. That's, that's where I went. So you came that's down. That's how I met you and Paul and Oliver. So you met Paul Bryant, Oliver Heath. And you. Yeah, we were all living at the Soul Inn. I, I believe it. Yeah, and we were all there. Uh, just the early days of the Jesus People Movement. And that was just about the time I moved out of there and, and brought my family up from Los Angeles and okay. started living in uh, uh, San Rafael. 128 Greenfield Avenue. Yeah. That's the address I remember. So, so you were baptized. <clears throat> I was. Who, I baptized you? No, the guy that told me about the baptism, his name was John Hagen. And I haven't really seen or heard from him since. But I, I know the name. Okay. Okay. Uh, at that, the, the Jesus People Movement had been on for about a year and a half or a little bit longer. And we, we would find each other. Yeah. And so we started to have relationships with groups all over the Bay Area. Yeah. And, uh, and so that ha that's how we went. Yeah, we baptized. I remember on some evenings coming, walking down from the, after the buses stopped walking down from the Haight-Ashbury all the way to the outer Richmond, yeah. walking down to the ocean and baptizing people. You couldn't even hear anything. <laughs> and then walking back, soaking so wet, wet, up to the soil. Bible study, the lady that told us about Jesus would say, we got to get together and study the Bible. And so we did on Tuesday nights. And I was still in a band, and so I started writing songs about Jesus and playing them in public. Really? And the first one I ever wrote was You'll Never Get to Heaven on LSD. That's your first song? About Jesus. You'll never get to heaven <laughs> on LSD. I love that <coughs> song, Greg. We're going to be singing okay. that tomorrow, right. by the way. You, um, we're going to ask you to play that song. My pleasure. Yeah. It, it, I've never forgotten it. I've, I've sung it a hundred times it or would, more. It would stop an audience because it, all the rest of our songs were about drugs. <laughs> and other things, you know, that were yeah. going on back then. But Sure. So you wrote that, that song early on. Yeah. So at what age did you actually become a Christian? 19. You were 19? I was 19. Okay, very close. I was 21 oh. when, I became, when I became a follower of Jesus. And uh, uh, I, was, I was not a hippie. I was a beatnik. Okay. I was in that period between the beat and the hip. The late 50s. Jack Kerouac, I was a Cher okay. Jack Kerouac guy. I'd lived yeah. on the road. Yeah. I lived that life. I loved it. It was not easy always. It was a little rough. <laughs> how, how, how did you get to um, Baraka House in San Anselmo? Well, the, <clears throat> somebody, and it might have been the same guy, John, had, I didn't want to go back to college. I seriously, my, what I thought back then was I read the Bible. I hadn't read the whole Bible. I probably started in the wrong place. I started in the book of Revelations. And uh, I read it through five times to get that special blessing for reading it, you know. I read it out <laughs> loud. I read it not, not out loud, but I knew that I had, I had to do something. The world had to know that, it was, that Jesus was coming back. And that's, that's a thought that I can't, it drives me. And it's it what motivates me to do things. Okay. The, the, the fact that I have the opportunity to let people know that there is a Savior and that Jesus is coming back. And you have to make some peace with God. You have to come to terms with that. Like paying taxes and death, it's one of those things that's just as certain as those two. And uh, it was easy to write songs like that. And it was easy to tell people about it. And I think God just had his hand and said, okay, I'm going to stick you over here in a, in a bunch of, with a bunch of other guys that are going to head in the same direction. Because it was no use to go back to school. And the guys in the band, half of them didn't mind doing it, but they weren't saved. So it was different. But there was just something. And looking back, it was, it was the Holy Spirit guiding my life in my footsteps. You know? okay. And he does that in a lot of strange ways with a lot of strange people. So I moved over there, and that's, I know that's where I belonged. And that's where I met you again. And David was living in the basement on Greenfield. And that's where I met him first. That's right. We, David Hoyt and his wife, uh, Victoria, right. and my, my wife and Bobby and I, and my two daughters, two daughters. we were living at what we called Zion's Inn. Exactly. Zion's <laughs> yes. Inn. 
And uh, David, yeah, it was David and Victoria in the basement, and uh, Bobby and I, and Laura and Jenna, I, Dory and Grace. Dory and Grace. Dory and Grace. We were living upstairs, and we had our Tuesday night Bible studies. That's right. Did you ever meet Moish Rosen? I did. Yes. And, and I just remember that was just at almost like the beginning of that Jews for Jesus ministry. Right. There were so many things that started up, like Christian Liberation Front, Jews for Jesus, right. and, and things like that in the Bay Area. One day, um, this guy showed up at our Bible study uh, in 1968, and he named his, we, he called himself Martin Rosen, right. and he was with you know, the American Board of Missions to the Jews, mm -hmm. and uh, he was just formulating just a ground, the groundwork for uh, Jews for Jesus. Right. And he would come to the Bible study. We worked together, Moish and I, for many years Mm. And uh, my oldest daughter was one of his first secretaries, oh. my daughter Dory. Okay. So you, got the, you were right there in the heart of the beginning of the Jesus People Movement in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and we were playing guitar and songs at the Bible says, weren't we? Yeah. yeah. But poorly. <laughs> well, <clears throat> they were new to me. They were new <laughs> to you. Okay. Uh, and I, I have a photo of you a black and white, standing in front of the Christian house on Noel Drive or something like that in San Anselmo, where Paul Bryant yeah, was the, right. the head of the house, and uh, Rick Ricketts. Rick Ricketts. You remember yeah. Rick? Yeah, he was the manager of our band before we got saved. That's right. Was he? He was. And he was a speed freak. Definitely. Oh, he was a speed freak. He had a hard time with, with meth. Oh, he, he did. did. Oh. But uh, he became a real solid rock, really a good guy. Uh, and um, so we started the band Joyful Noise. We did. And that essentially it was because of you. Hmm. Uh, I knew about three chords. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know a few more than that. <laughs> but anyway, I learned a few more as time went on. Um, and by the way, oh, I want to mention now before I forget, you have a number of CDs that you've put out. Uh, are they available on Amazon? No. They're not? <clears throat> no. How, how do people get a hold of your music, Greg? I always put my phone number inside the CD, and they call me and I mail them one. Okay. Oh, would you mind at the end of the program I put your name so they can call you? I wouldn't mind at all. Okay, okay. This is not a commercial deal. You, you, I didn't ask for any money, right? I don't sell them. <laughs> you I, don't sell them? You just mail them out? Yeah. He doesn't sell them. He just mails them out. So I'm going to have, you'll see Greg's phone number, and he'll mail them out. The wonderful music, Greg, your own stuff, and it's what I call authentic. Mm. It's authentic music, the authentic stuff that comes from your heart. And that's, that's what I love about your music, Greg. Yeah, it's a number of different styles. Yeah, the number of different styles. It's yeah. not, yeah, you know, it's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Now, um, I want to talk about your wife. How did you meet your wife? <clears throat> well, like I say, I moved up to Spokane in 1970. And when I got there, before I got there, in 1969, I went up, Rick and I, and a guy named Steve. And uh, <clears throat> we just started, we got a bunch of those right on newspapers from Jack Sparks. Right on newspapers, And yeah. we went up to a place called Grangeville, Idaho, in the middle of December, in a truck with no heater, because <laughs> it was from California. But anyway, we survived. And... We started out on the streets in Lewiston, Idaho, just walking down the street, three hippies, telling people about Jesus. And after we got done at the police department, they let us back out <laughs> because they weren't sure if we were a front for drugs or what. But they, a couple of pastors came to our defense, and uh, one of them s said, well, where are you staying? And we said, Grangeville. He says, you stay at my church. And it was... Uh, the Open Bible Church okay. in Lewiston, and it was just right next to downtown, so it was perfect. And he, and he said, you sleep in the pews? I said, lots of people do. So we got along real well. And he, him and his wife took care of us just like we were Jesus. I mean, it was, it was a beautiful thing, and it was just somehow only God could put it together. Yeah. And people came to get saved. I mean, they, we would pray with people daily. We would just bring them back to his church because we felt that was a safe place. But it was New Year's Eve, 
and they'd let us play it. Rick and I and Steve all played guitars, and Rick played bongo drums, and it was a real makeshift deal, but it, the Spirit of God was in it. And they would let us play at the high school. They would let us play at the, I guess it's sort of like a high school thing across the street where they had like a restaurant. Okay. Anyway, we played there and got to know people and prayed with people. And uh, <clears throat> this one girl says, well, what are you guys doing New Year's Eve? Well, nothing. So they drug us downtown to this club downtown, which was called Casey's, which was the club in town. And they said, we talked to the band, and they said that it's okay if you play during their break, at, right after midnight. <laughs> right after midnight. Right after midnight. <laughs> so Rick and, and Steve and I got up there, and we did those songs. You know, We did Oh Holy Joe, and we did uh, I'm So Glad Jesus Set Me Free. I'm so glad. We're going to do that tomorrow. That's a great song. and I, There's so many verses to it. We'll have to weed some of them out. But, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and we did Never Get to Heaven on LSD, and we did... One, it's called the Judgment Day Flash. It's sort of a longer one. Okay. And uh, and we were just finishing up, and I and I looked out of the corner of my eye, and right off to the side of the stage was three of the guys that were in the band that were playing for that New Year's Eve gig. Oh, I see. Okay. In that band, <clears throat> and they were just standing there looking at us with their mouths open, and so we we had to go back around where they were, and they said. As soon as we get out of here, you got, you got to tell us about this Jesus. Really? So we went to the Chinese restaurant, which was two, two stores down, probably, and sat there the rest of the night and told them about Jesus. And <clears throat> three of them got saved. Wow. So I went back to California. And I, I had another friend that I talked to up there and had met, and his mother fed us constantly so we wouldn't die. And he got saved, and he was in a different band. So I went back to California, and Jimmy wrote me and told me what happened. He said, <clears throat> the guys in the Wilson McKinley, three of them just want to do nothing but play music for Jesus, and the bass player doesn't. So they grabbed me, because I play bass, and that's what we're doing now. Okay. So when I got back up there, they had just gotten started, and Linda Meisner had just come through town. Linda Meisner, yeah. Who was doing outreaches in the park in Spokane. And they got up and they played, you know, those guys did. And it went over real well because everybody knew them. They were a very, very popular band at that time in that area. Yeah. And the fact that their lives had changed was a message to a lot of people. Sure. So we ended up getting together. I hauled them around and played by myself in between their sets. And we did that until the weather got cold, because it's a little cold to play outside up there. It's not like Golden Gate Park. But. Right. <laughs> and um, did you play for us when we went to Golden Gate yes. on the back of a, a yes. truck, and we did a whole concert, and a lot of people came? I played bass. You were there, and you yes. played bass. I did. OK. I, I, was you played, played guitar. I was playing rhythm, but who do we have any, did we have a lead guitar? Not that I remember, but there was at least three or four of us up there. Yeah, there was, yeah. Larry, I think Larry Gottlieb was playing drums. Larry Gottlieb, yes, yes. you're right. Larry's up in, um, uh, up near Eugene, Oregon now. He's still alive, still going. You know, the last, I can tell you the last time I saw Larry, it was in, and it wasn't the best scenario. It was, in the, it was in Dallas, Texas, when Billy Graham was doing the crusade. And we went down there to witness on the streets. It was part of our going across country tour and we chap happened to line it up then. And there's a lot of good stories from that, but that's the last time I've seen Larry and, oh, another guy you don't know. Okay. His name is J.D. Katie. Okay. But it was, Larry was there and he was with the children of God then. I know, Larry got pulled into that cult. Yes, he did. Um, and um, that's how I got contact <clears throat> with him. In fact, my wife and I, Katie, uh, we stopped and visited him several years ago. Mm, and he's completely out, good. completely out, doing well, not physically. Started a restaurant, became very successful. Good. And uh, he would like to have been here today. Be Larry would have liked to have been, been here. It special for he'll, me. He'll, he'll be watching this. <laughs> I'll make sure Larry gets Hi, this. Hi, Larry. Good to see you. <laughs> I'll be sure he gets this. Um, but... Uh, so now, uh, I, now, you met my wife. I, I, yeah, I yeah, how'd you, how you meet your wife? Okay, Greg. I was 
Okay, we got to Spokane. We hooked up with the Wilson McKinley, and uh, Rick, Rick and I parted ways. Uh, nothing bad. He got married. Okay. And I just felt that no. Well, let's clarify this. My first wife or my second wife? <laughs> okay. I came back here in 1970, and I'm just going to say the way it was. Uh, there was a lot of people at, at Greenfield Avenue uh, for a Bible study that had come from all over the area. Sure. And there was a girl there, and um, Rick, Rick told me that he thought that maybe her and I ought to get together. Okay. And I I know, man, I got time for that. I just didn't. I, I was focused on Jesus coming back in less than a year. You didn't have time to get married and raise a family in that amount of time. So anyway, I, I ended up getting married. Do you remember her name? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, you don't want to say it. It's okay. Well. I probably knew I, her. You probably did. And, and I, I'm not ashamed to say her name, but I just don't know. Don't I, want her I involved. I just, just respect her enough still to, okay. to let her, if she wants to call the number, I will say, okay, uh, this is her name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. And so we came back to Idaho and that lasted a month. Wow. So I said, God, what do you want me to do? This is tearing me inside out. I fasted, I prayed for a good week, and I said, what am I supposed to do? I know you got something for me. And um, the guys in the band, Wilson McKinley, were on their way to Boise and they had nothing to haul their equipment in. And I said, I got a van, I'll haul it wherever you want. And I ended up back in Spokane. I, we worked together for four years in a ministry that went pretty much, the publication went all over the world. Some of us got as far as France, I didn't. I stayed in this country. But my wife was a part of that. She grew up in Spokane. Her name's Debbie. Debbie, right. She's beautiful. She was the prettiest girl in town, so I married her. <laughs> after we fought for years. Um, somehow that's the way it works. But we were part of the same ministry. She was more on the, the publication end, getting the tools ready so we could go out in the streets. But the girls did too. And okay. we kept things pretty separate. It was uh, similar to what you had in Marin. Yes. I mean, the girls stayed here and the guys stayed over there, you know. And, it's, yeah. and it worked. It worked. How did you support yourself during this time, Craig? We trusted God. The Bible says that they, they went out and everything they needed was supplied for them. And we, we didn't have jobs, and there was about 200 of us. And uh, we started publishing a paper, like it looked like a tabloid, it was called The Truth. And we would go out on the streets and use that as an excuse to confront people and ask them if they knew about Jesus or strike up some sort of conversation. Sure. And through that, and, and if they wanted to donate, they could. It was not mandatory. Of course, and, yeah. And people would donate, and uh, other people in churches in town supported us, bits and pieces, things like that. The, this was the rule. And back in, in the early 70s, you could go, you could get a lot of gas for five bucks. Oh, yes. You could. And I had a van. They would give me, they would fill it up in Spokane and give me five bucks. And they say, you drive, that would get you to Seattle, you know, and so, or Portland, or, you know, southern places. So as soon as you get to the next place, fill it up with gas again, and don't come back this way. Keep going until you get to some place that God directs you to. And we did. And the stories are amazing how God would provide us with places to stay food to eat, and enough money to get gas to where we needed to be and get us back to Spokane. Really? And we sort of lived communally. There was like 20 guys in a house, and it was just a place to sleep pretty much. And we tried to keep half of the guys out of town. And then when they got back, the other half would leave. And then we would stay in Spokane and talk to people on the streets in Spokane. And these were the years, From early 70s? From 70 until 79. Until 79. I stayed with that group. Yeah. Right, okay. 
Yeah, the, uh, the Jesus people movement around here went from about 67 to 72, mm -hmm. maybe stretch it on a little bit more. Other <clears throat> places, a little bit longer, yeah. depending. Uh, but but by, by the time you said the Jesus people movement was, it was a real awakening. It was. God pours out his Holy Spirit, okay. signs and wonders, you know, just like you. We, we never had any money. No. And God always provided for us amazingly, he amazingly. Did. I remember that. But then things changed. Okay. Then things changed. Now, did you, did you have any kids? After I got married, yeah. After you got yeah. married? <laughs> well, this was a good idea, Greg. Okay. <laughs> uh, Debbie and I got married in 1974. 74, okay. And that put us in a little bit of a different position with the ministry because we were living in the, the ministry-sponsored houses up until then. But we needed a place of our own, and so I went out and got a job. God provided me with a job and a place to stay, and, but we were still a part of the ministry. But it has started to change in 74. Uh, we ended up buying a bus, not me, but the ministry did, like a Greyhound style, and the, and the teams that would go out would go out less frequently, and the band fit on the bus. And they would get invitations to different parts of the country, and they would go and come back. So it was a little different than just going out on the street like, sure. it, like it was. And a lot of us ended up getting jobs, but we, we stayed a part of that. And um, we ended up deciding that we needed a ranch out of town. And so we bought 350 acres and uh, stayed there until 1979. Okay. And you had kids. I did. I ended up with four. Four? Four. Two boys and then two girls. Okay. And Sounds good. Now, we don't have much time. Okay. Uh, I want to know what you're doing right now, Greg. Right now, I work with the uh, Union Gospel Mission in Spokane. Union Gospel Mission? As a volunteer. As a volunteer. And I have for maybe 40 years. Wow. And I, I do the chapel services mostly because I like to talk and I like to sing. Okay. And it's a good combination, but there's other things I get to do with them, too. All right. It's a blessing. All right. Wow, Craig, it's, it's amazing that we, after all these years, have an opportunity to talk almost as half a century later. It's almost a half, half a, pretty close to half a century. And the Jesus People Movement, we look back on, and what, partially what I'm doing with this programming is, is to capture it for future generations so you can know the outpouring mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit, the fourth American awakening. Okay. Now, in a minute, we're going to say goodbye, and All we're, right. uh, we're going to bring some other people in, into the studio, Karen, Ken and Mary Sanders, Kenny Hopkins, and Janine Wright, who were all a part of Joyful Noise. Good. After you were gone, we, after you left, we had to get somebody. There's and we got, people. and the Lord provided us yes, with some did. other people, and they're going to be on, and you'll be able to see uh, these other people uh, in some more programming of why we are Christians. So keep looking, and you'll see. We thank you, Greg. It's a blessing for coming Ken. down here from Spokane. <laughs> thank you, my brother. It's, it's my All privilege. Right. So long.